this morning. As you can see, I got on my jersey because today is Jersey Sunday. I remind you from last week, if you're wearing your jersey, just type in the comments today what team you're repping. If you haven't put your jersey on, you got a couple of minutes, go put your jersey on so you can be a part of our fun Jersey Day today. I just, again, want to let you know I'm glad that you're here. I want you to just enjoy the service today. I want you to worship like you've never worshipped the Lord before because He is worthy to be praised. I pray you've had a great week. I pray that you have come this morning ready to hear a word from our Father. Our worship team has prepared themselves and they are waiting for you to join us in worship this morning. So guess what? It's time for worship. Let's go in the sanctuary. Bye-bye. Good morning, Lighthouse. Thank you so much for tuning in to our virtual service. I pray that you guys all had a blessed week, and I pray that you guys enjoyed the service. Now I'm going to give prayer to this. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us here today, Father. God, thank you for a fresh year, Father. God, help us to obey and honor you, Father. Reveal new open doors for us and help us to follow God. In Jesus' name.
Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of this word.
Lord. Praise the Lord. God is so good on this day. Uh, as our worship team has, has led us into this place of worship, has reminded us that to worship you, I live. I live to worship you, O oh Lord. I don't know about you, but if you could just take a moment at home just to thank God, just be reminded of the things that you have. I know that there are some things that we don't have. I know there are some things that we want. I know there are some things that we wish we did have, but can we just take a second, can we just take a moment and be thankful for the things that God has blessed us with, for life, for health, for strength, for roofs over our head, for being able to come into God's house in spirit and worship him, even in your own house. I thank you, O oh God, that we serve a God that even when we can't be together, we are still with our heavenly father because he dwells in every place, every secret place. He is there. And so we just say to you, O oh God, on this day that we worship you, that the reason that we live, the reason we exist is to worship you, O oh God. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you. Thank you. We live to worship you. We live to magnify your name. We live to glorify you. Let our lives be a sweet incense unto you. We worship you, O oh God. We worship you. Good morning, Lighthouse. Thank God for our space in the building, as they say. Thank God for allowing us to be here yet another Sunday. My name is uh, Minister Mark, and I am here uh, at Lighthouse Community Church of God, and we just want to thank you for joining us on this digital space. Uh, I would just like to take a moment to just remind you, to let you know that uh, we do have uh, an, an online platform that allows you to be able to uh, to be able to chat, to be able to speak to one of our uh, one of the individuals that are, are standing by, that are willing to take prayer requests. Um, and we're not so formal that you can only get on and give prayer requests. Uh, if you want to get on there, if you want to say a, you want to type in an amen, you want to type in a hallelujah, you want to type in a praise God, you want to respond to something, then you feel free to do so. We actually encourage it because it makes our service feel more connected. It makes us feel a little more connected to you. So we welcome you to do that. So again, welcome, welcome, welcome to our service uh, here at Lighthouse Community Church of God. Uh, I just want to say that I uh, am so glad to be here on today. Um, our pastor has, Pastor Dale has started a series uh, for the year, uh, so more of a theme, if you will, uh, and, and that theme has consisted for the last two weeks, it, 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 Pastor Dale has really opened our eyes to what it looks like to love God, and, and, and secondly, what it looks like to love others. She's challenged us to love God and challenge us to love others and, 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 and open our eyes even more so, reveal even more so that truthfully you really can't love others correctly. You can't love others the right way. You can't love others truly without truly having a love for God. But in our theme this year, it's consisted of three three compartments, three three different things. Not just loving God, not just loving others, but the third thing is making disciples. Again, this year our focus is loving God, loving others, and making disciples. Loving God, loving others, and making disciples. Thank you to our pastor who has led us into this season uh, of, of, of 
of understanding, of knowledge, of, of, of seeking God uh, in, in a more truer sense. And this week, I would like to talk to you about that third, uh, that third tier, if you will, of our uh, mission for the year, of our focus or our concentration for the year, which is to make disciples. To make disciples. Will you pray with me before we get, begin? Our gracious God, we want to thank you. We thank you for um, just allowing us to be here even in this digital space, oh God. We thank you uh, in advance for your word going out to your people, oh God. Lord, we pray that someone would hear this word, that, that it, would, it would do exactly what your word says, that it would not go out void, but it would, it, it would sink down, Lord, into some good soil, and it would produce a harvest. Father God, we thank you for being able to worship you in spirit and in truth. There are places across the world where people have to hide to say the things that we are saying. There are places where they, they, have, to, they have to meet in secret in order to talk about the things of God. But Lord, we're able to be here freely worshiping you. Maybe sometimes we take it for granted, but Lord, we just want to take a moment and say thank you. Now I ask, Lord, that you would move me out of the way and that you would have your mighty God-like way and that these words that are said today would bless someone. Lord, that the words that are said today might help to convict us that we might change, that someone might be encouraged to do better because our desire is to be more like you, O oh God. Father, we thank you and we're believing that you are everything that we need. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. So as I said before, uh, in terms of how these build on themselves, obviously, uh, you, you really can't love others well uh, without loving God. Because you need God's love in order to love others well. Because truthfully, if we look in, in, in the scriptures, John tells us that, that God is love. He is love. And, and these building blocks that build on each other don't stop when it comes to discipleship. In order to, to, to truly make disciples, we first have to be disciples. And, and if we're going to be good disciples, we really can't do that without loving others. If we really can't love others without first loving God. So all of these things build on each other. So I, I, I know for some people they've heard this word discipleship or disciple or making disciples. It's almost become a buzzword or a hot topic around, around church circles. And, and I'm, 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 I'm hoping that today I can help us unpack what that looks like. What, what does it really mean to be a disciple? It certainly means more than just sitting on the sideline. People have referred to being a fan or a follower, whether you're following Christ or whether you're just kind of sitting in the stands. It's more than just sitting in the stands. It's following alongside. It's following closely. But I know for some of us, we've heard time and time again that really, if you just believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. And that's, that's the Bible. That's, that's the word. Romans, Romans 10 and 9. That's, that's the word. But sometimes we have to take a closer look at what God, God's word is really saying. When, when we look at the text in Romans 10 and 9, and it's saying that we have to confess 
with our mouth, yes, and we have to believe with our hearts. It doesn't say that we have to believe with our minds. It says that we have to believe with our heart. How do you believe with your heart? Because it's about more than just thinking that something will work. It's believing. It's acting on it. So if I believe that, that this water is, is, is not poisonous, that, that there's nothing wrong with it, that it will hydrate me, then I'll actually take a drink of the water. I, I believe that it does what it says it's going to do. So I, I acted upon it. See, it's about more than simply thinking that, that, that God is who he says he is. But if we truly believe it, if we truly trust him, then we begin to follow in his footsteps. Whether we like him or not, we believe that what he said in his word is true. Things like it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Society tells us that, that certainly it's more blessed to receive, right? It would be more, more comfortable, that it would be more helpful if we receive. But God's word turns some things upside down and tells us, no, no, it's not more beneficial for you to receive. It's actually more beneficial for you to give. And the God of all the universe can make statements like that because he is instituting principles. He is, is putting things in the, in the motion that we don't even understand. So, so even when we're giving, God is saying, I, I know it looks different. I know it looks strange when you're giving and, and you feel like you, you're losing out, but don't worry because as you're giving out, I'm putting something in. And I'm not simply here to tell you that, that, that you're giving $5 and God is putting $10 in your pocket. But I can tell you that I, as, as I have given in my own experience, as I have given, I have been so blessed to have some, some other things given to me. Even when I was sick months ago, my wife and I, both had COVID at the same time, trying to take care of two children, and neither of my children were sick. I know that may be a small miracle to you, but I was praying daily, Lord, I, I know that I'm not well, would you, would you heal my body? I know my wife is not well, would you heal her body? But Lord, help us to take care of them, and we pray that they don't fall ill to this and the Lord brought us out of it and even in the midst of that we didn't stop giving and the Lord was able to give something to us that was far more valuable than money how can you pay for good health how can you pay to be in your right mind you can't you can't so God wants to remind us, if you will, that he is in control. Even when we look at the world and we see things that seem far beyond our control, they, they, they are far above our head, but they're still below his feet. God is still in control. He hasn't lost control. And he's still blessing us. He's still providing what we need. Let me, let me get back on track. Let me get back on track. And so the text, the text tells us that we have to believe with our hearts. And if we're going to, to believe, if we're truly going to believe, more than simply just hearing what someone said and, and saying that it's a good thought, if we're really going to act on it, if we're really going to walk in it, if we're really going to trust God for what he says and believe that what he says is true, my challenge to you would be to put your money where your mouth is. Put your money where your mouth is. I don't, I don't know if you know, but, but we're, in, we're in playoff season, so in the NFL, and, and, and there are teams that are battling to win the championship. So we're towards, uh, we're in the, the second round, we're after the wild card round, and, and we have a few teams that are gonna be playing this weekend, right? Some teams that played yesterday, and then we got some teams that are playing today. And, and I actually am, am, am a little partial to a couple teams that are playing today. The teams that are lined up, if I had, had, had to, to pick some teams, I, I really like the Saints. I mean, Tom Brady's okay, but I really 
comments as if you want to take a second and we got some football fans out there, go ahead and put it in the chat. Go ahead and, 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 and tell us the team that you're rooting for. Tell us the team that you think that you like or that you think is going to win. So with that, my question is, you may think they're going to win, but how much would you be willing to bet that they're going to win? Yeah, I said, how much will you be willing to bet that they're going to win? If you were going to put your money where your mouth is, how would you be willing to bet your house? Would you be willing to bet your life savings? How much would you be willing to bet? Now, I'm not condoning gambling. Don't think that that's what I'm saying. Not at all. We need to put our trust in God. He will take care of us. He will provide all of our needs. But I'm saying when it comes to putting our money where our mouth is, sometimes I think we fall short when it comes to Christ. We say that we believe. We say that, that we think that the word is true. But then we run across scriptures that say, that if someone slaps you to turn the other cheek. We were in Bible study uh, 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 the other day and, 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 and someone mentioned turning the other cheek. I'm not going to mention no names, but one of the, one of the saints said, I, after I finished slapping them under the bus, not, not just slapping them to the bus, not just slapping them on the bus. I'm going to slap them under the bus. I think they figured the bus was going to run them over after they slapped them. And once the bus had ran them over, they said, then they would extend their hand to them and say, can we talk about what's going on? Because I'm not going to allow you to put your hands on me. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to, to ruffle any feathers or, or maybe I am. Maybe I'm saying that, maybe I'm challenging us in terms of are we really putting our money where our mouth is in terms of our Heavenly Father? When he says that it's more blessed to give, do we actually take him at his word and attempt to give unashamed? Do we attempt to be generous? Do we attempt to be compassionate? Or do we attempt to be like the world and try to gather and hold on to as much as we can? Do we really trust God? Are we really putting our money where our mouth is? And I can even say, you know what, if you put your money where your mouth is, when it comes to Christ, are, are, are you willing to tithe like the Lord has called us to tithe? Are you willing to, to, to give what, what, what God has, has asked of you to give? Are you, are you willing to give that 10% that, that, that the scripture says that we should give? Are you willing to do that? Because sometimes we just put a couple dollars in the offering, even though God has, has blessed us tremendously. Did you think about tithing off that stimulus the Lord blessed you with? The word says that every good and perfect, perfect gift comes from the Lord. I know you think it came from the government. Uh, he, the government was just the vehicle to get it to you. Every good and perfect gift coming from the Lord, it was still sent to you by God. So did you did you give the Lord some of that? Did you put your money where your mouth is for too long? We've decided not to, to put our money where our mouth is. In the book of James, the, the brother of Jesus, in the book that he writes, he says, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. You can, you can believe, but, but if, you're, if you don't truly, if you don't truly have some action behind your belief, then can we really say that you believe, can, can you really say that you believe what you say you believe, or is it just lip service? Is it just lip service? Can I, 
can I read you a passage from James chapter 2, verse 14? I, I, I just like to read it to you. We can, we can let the text talk. We can, we can let the text speak to us tonight. James chapter 2, verse 14, and it reads, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you do not show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. The reason that I make this point is because sometimes we feel like it's enough just to have some words just, just to say that we believe, but yet our deeds don't seem to follow the deeds that we see in Scripture. Pastor Dale reminded us that, that Scripture tells us that we ought to love our enemies, pray for those who persecute you, and do good to those who despitefully use you. That's what Scripture says. So when those Scriptures come to mind, do you believe that? Do you believe that that's what God has called you to? And do you put the action behind it to actually love those who are your enemy? Is God worth it? Is he, is he worth it to do that? So, my question behind this, behind all of this, this uh, do we really believe it? And, and put your money where your mouth is. If, if, if we're really thinking along those lines, shouldn't we be challenged today? Shouldn't we be challenged today? If you consider yourself a follower of Christ, are you satisfied with just being someone who follows afar off? Or do you think that you want to be what Christ calls a disciple? Someone that follows closely. Someone that, that's right up on them. That's, that's, that, that, that. One, 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 uh, one preacher said that uh, we can be covered in the dust of our rabbi. That, that our teacher, that the person that's discipled us is Jesus, and we walk so closely behind him. And, and, and in Jesus' time, right, this, this, the cities were oftentimes dirt, and, and, and the dirt that would be kicked up from the rabbi would be all over the face of those who were close enough to him. Are we following that close behind our Savior? That's, that's the look that a disciple has. So, can I talk about football a little bit? Can I bring football into this a little bit more? Do, do you mind? I hope not, because I am. So today, there are set, there are a few teams playing today. Uh, there's the Saints versus the Bucks and the Chiefs versus the Browns. And each team is going, essentially, each team is, is trying to win the game. In order to win the game, for those of you that don't know much about football, you have to get to the other end zone. You have to get to the other goal, if you will. And then the opposing team, their job is to stop you from getting to that goal. If you can cross the line uh, via running, uh, uh, via catching a pass, if you can cross the line, you get seven points. If you can kick a field goal, you get three points. And so the objective is not just to kick a field goal. I mean, you'll settle for a field goal, but the actual objective is to cross the line as many times as you can. But there are very strong, very fast, and very intelligent, and very large men that are attempting to stop you from crossing that goal line. These, these men get paid millions of dollars to stop you from getting across that goal line. I mean, equally, uh, the, the, there are, the men get paid millions of dollars to, uh, to, to, to get to that goal line. 
So there's a lot riding on this game. But if we're honest, there's a lot of chaos in a game where you have two opposing teams that are trying to stop each other or prevent each other from getting to a certain place. That means that there's essentially no point of agreement. There's no point. They're never okay with the other team scoring, even if it's three points, e e e even, even if it's a safety for two points. I, I don't want to get too, too deep in the football game. Okay, we're going to keep it basic. But there's no amount of points that the other team is okay with being scored upon. They don't want you to score at all. So there's no point of agreement. There's no safe space. It is completely 100% battle for every single inch on that field. So how many teams are we talking about? Each game has two separate teams attempting to oppose their will on the other team. But Dr. Tony Evans, the best-selling author, proposes that there's a third team that's taking the field. And the third team is the team of officials, or you may know them as referees. Officials or referees, they're a team in and of their self. They are a team. If you ask them, we are a team of officials. We are referees. We stick together. We make decisions together. We are a team. Now the thing is, is that they don't belong to either of the opposing teams. They don't belong to either uh, the, the, the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, and they certainly don't belong to the Cleveland Browns, if you were to take those teams. They stand alone. They're a different team. See, the league actually has an office, and that office is located at 300 Park Avenue in New York. And there is a commissioner that sits behind the desk at that very location, and his name is Roger Goodell. And the referees essentially are his representatives to make sure that what happens in the game is according to the rules and regulations that he set down. They're given a book to study to make sure that they are doing everything that they're supposed to do, that they're throwing the right flags, that they're making the right calls, that, that, that when, when, when it's a call that, that they're not sure about, sometimes that team has to come together and confer with each other. And, 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 and now there's even become another component where they talk to the person in the booth. Sometimes we have to go to instant replay and they have to talk to somebody in the booth and say, what did you see on this play? Because I was in the midst of the game. I, my vision was limited. My sight was limited. But I needed to talk to somebody in the booth that was able to see on a camera all the way down to being able to see a quarter on the ground. What did you see? These are the officials. Their job is to bring those rules, regulations, and authority from the New York office, right, where, where, where they run things, and to, to bring, bring it from there to the field of play to make sure that they are playing according to, to exactly the, 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 the agreed upon stipulations and regulations that, that have been agreed upon by the, the, the owner and the teams, the, the, the team owners and the commissioner. They are carrying out the mission of the lead slash the commissioner. So, what does that 
mean for us? What, is, what, is, what does that look like for us? Well, as referees, they have to keep their emotions completely separate from doing their job. How they feel about things is irrelevant. How they feel, and they can't base whether they're going to throw a flag or call a penalty because their favorite color is orange or red. They can't uh, call a penalty or, or, or throw a flag because they have a family member that's on the team. They are supposed to be neutral. They are supposed to be objective. The only flags that they are throwing, the only, the only way that they are imposing a will on the team is because it's imposing the will of a commissioner who sits way in New York. And so my question is, are we doing just that? Are, are we doing that if we are God's referees? If we're God's referees, if we're stepping into the game of life, have we decided that, that whatever rule God has passed down, whatever regulations he has passed down, we're going to keep our personal feelings out of it. We're not going to try to be people pleasers. We're not going to try to, to be swayed by the crowd. We're not going to even try to be swayed by the teams. But we're only going to be focused on what the commissioner's desires are. And at this point, you, you hear what I'm saying? We're only going to be, be swayed by what God thinks of us. We're not going to be swayed by someone running up to us saying, oh, I, I really didn't commit that foul. I really didn't, that really wasn't the penalty that I committed. See, I don't know if you've noticed, but this world is in a bit of chaos. This world is in a bit of chaos. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm understating that. I'm, there is so much chaos that's going on in the world. This very country sometimes seems to be falling apart at the seams. People wanting to, to tear into the capital. Threats being made because the country is falling apart in, in the sense that we are falling away from God. And we need, this country needs representatives, this country needs referees, this country needs disciples that are willing to stand, not and just say, this is what I believe, not and just say, this is what I think is good, not and just say, say this is what I want to do on this particular occasion, not say that I'm willing to make business deals because they'll just benefit me, not just say that I'm willing, willing to be a father because this is the way I think a father or a mother should react. I'm standing on the promises of God. I, I, I'm utilizing the rule book. I'm utilizing God's word, his scripture, his text, his, 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 his words that he breathed onto a text that we call the Bible. And I'm going to use his desires. I'm going to use the things that he wants to happen. I'm going to use his rules, his regulation, and his authority in order to carry out his mission. This is what disciples of Christ should be doing. So can you ask yourself, are you a disciple of Christ? Are you attempting to help, help assist in the, in the mission and journey of God to bring his kingdom here to earth? Are you attempting to look at your life and make everything that you do submitted to your king, your commissioner? Because referees don't have, it's not about their opinion. It's not about how they feel on a given play at a given time. 
It's not, it's not about that. It's about making sure that God's will and his way is carried out. I know, I know. Their job is to make sure that the commissioner's will and way is carried out. But if we are disciples of Christ, if we are like referees and our opinion goes by the wayside, and we should be attempting to carry out God's will and his way because we are disciples and we follow him and we put our money where our mouth is. We put actions on our faith. We put feet on our faith. We're not simply trying to hold on to everything that we can because we recognize that there is a life beyond this one that God has prepared for us. He says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And that, that imagery is just to remind us how amazing and how great and how much God has. The cattle on a thousand hills a thousand hills. God is really just showing us that everything is mine. So, I would like to point out a couple things that we can learn from our referees or our disciples of Christ. As disciples of Christ, maybe I can say that, as disciples of Christ, let's, let's look at a couple things that we can learn from our referees. Number one, don't be offended when folks attack you. Don't be offended when folks attack you. Don't, don't, you don't have to curl up and, and say, oh, woe is me. Why, why, are they, why are they attacking me? Why don't they like me at work? Why, why, why don't my friends want to hang out with me? Why don't folks want to talk to me? Why, why am I not as cool as other people? I, I'll tell you why. Let's look at John chapter 15, verse 18 through 19. If the world hates you, not dislikes you, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. This is Jesus talking. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it. If you belong to the world, then the world would love you. But, but Jesus is telling us, guess what? You don't belong to the world. You don't to, to team A or team B. You don't play for the Chiefs or the Browns. You're one of the referees. You're one of the ones that's carrying out my will. So therefore, I promise you that people will actually dislike you. I'm sorry, can, can I use the, the language that the scripture says? Oh, there are going to be people that hate you. But he says you don't belong to this world. He said, you are no longer a part of this world. The referees are in the game, but they are something altogether different. The rest of the, the text goes on to say, Jesus says, I chose you to come out of the world. So it hates you. The world hates you because God chose you. God, God pulled you out. And, and so, yes, is there going to be some jealousy? Is there going to be some frustration? Is there going to be some irritation? Is there going to be some hate towards you? Yes, haters going to hate. But that's okay. Haters can hate. Haters can hate. Because God says, this is not, this isn't your home. I've prepared a place for you. you. You're visiting. This is not your permanent residence. You are with me, and my kingdom is elsewhere. Can, 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 can we look at the second point? So, so point number one, don't be offended when folks attack you because they're not just attacking you, they're attacking what you represent. Number two, number two, you are not on either side. You are not on either side. You are not on either team. You're not team A or team B. You're not on either side. See, the world is full of sides. The world is full of, of things that oppose one another. And, and we're none of those things. We're, we're not those things. We are referees. We are neutral. We're not, we're not for either side. We're for God. And we have to remember that. We have to 
to remember that at the end of the day, our job is to represent Christ in everything that we do. Can I just talk about a few, a few sides? Can I, can I talk about a few sides? Now, I'm going to ask you if you find yourself on one of these sides, feel free to put it in the chat. Feel free to put it in the chat. I'm gonna tell you when to. I'm gonna tell you when to stop because there's some things. There's some. There's some lighter things I, I want to put in. Can I put the lighter things out there? I want to put some lighter things out there. What about Coke versus Pepsi? Oh yeah, I know we got some folks out there. Coke versus Pepsi. Are you a Coke? Are you a Coca-Cola person? Or are you a ice cold Pepsi person? Are you a summer or are you a winter person? Do you like when it's freezing cold and snow outside and sitting by the fire? Or do you like do you like when it's so warm that, that you can get so nice and hot that you can go out and go swimming? What about, what about pancakes and waffles? Pancakes? Waffles? Go ahead, put it in the chat. Go ahead, put it in the chat. Which one are you? What about sausage or bacon? Yeah, we're going with the breakfast special, okay? Sausage or bacon? What about grits or hash browns? Grits or hash browns? Grits or hash browns? I'm definitely a hash brown person. Can we, can we, can we look at some things that, some, this may not relate to some of you, but what about IG or Twitter? Are you an IG person? Are you a Twitter person? If you're a Facebook Facebook person, you automatically are old. That's what the young people say. Those are not my words. I'm not calling anybody old. But the young people say if you use Facebook, you're old. The young people use IG or Twitter, apparently. What about PlayStation or Xbox? What game system do you like to play on? What about shopping? You like online or in person? Are you uh, the person that has Amazon packages show up every day? Or you still like to go in the Kohl's and, and make your purchases? Still like to show up to Walmart every now and again? Are you Michigan? Or are you Michigan State? Are you coffee? Or are you tea? Do you like the text? Or do you like the, the phone call so you can actually hear the inflection and tone in people's voices? Are you pineapple on pizza or no? Go ahead, put it in the chat, put it in the chat. Pineapple on pizza or no? I can do pineapple on pizza, I don't mind, I don't mind. But there are these sides, there are these polarizing sides. Those were lighter, but here's, here's some real sides. Here's some, here's, here's some things that, that people will, will argue with you about. Here's some people that, that some things that, that people will get real heated about. Don't put these in the chat, don't put these in the chat. There, there's a side that says that we need racial justice in this country. And then there's a side that says we need racial conciliation, not reconciliation, but conciliation. There's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a movement right now that says that we're never going to be able to be reconciled. We're never going to be able to come together. We'll never ever be able to be united. We can only be separate. I don't think Christ died for us to be separate. I think Christ died and his finished work on the cross was for us to be together in unity. What about red versus blue? Democrats versus Republican. I'm not asking you where you find yourself. But just think about these polarizing differences even recently. In this country, we've seen this country seemingly tearing itself apart at the Capitol because of their opinions about democracy. So, let's be honest. We are on the field but we're not of the field. 
in John, that's a part of what he was saying, is that, is that I've chosen you. I've set you apart. You're no longer just on a team. I'm not, I'm not telling you, I hope you don't hear me saying don't vote, don't be a part. No, we have to be in the game. We have to be present. We have to be aware. We, we, we have to be conscious of what's going on, but we cannot allow our consciousness and our awareness to supersede God's authority. We are here to exercise and implement God's authority, not our own. And when we allow our own opinion to get in the way of hearing from God or moving on God's behalf, then guess what? We're no longer walking or acting like disciples. Third thing, you have to be, I'm sorry, you, you have to be on you have to be on the field to affect the game. I'm sorry. You have to be on the field to affect the game. You have to be on the field to affect the game. Because we are God's representatives in this world. Don't think that we can simply sit on the sidelines, that we can simply hide out. This was the main thing that I, I wanted to say on this point in terms of us being on the field. We have to be present. We have to, we have to open up our minds. We have to talk to some people. We, got, we have to be there. Are you an undercover Christian? Are, are you working for, for the spiritual CIA? Are, are you working for the spiritual FBI? Are you undercover? Are you a spy? I don't never. I don't know if you know this. I mean, I, I'm sure you have. But referees have horrible outfits. They wear black pants and they wear striped shirts. Big, ugly, black and white striped shirts. And the point is, so that you can tell them apart from everybody else. John just told us, I've called you to be separate. I've called you to, to, to away from everyone else. I've called you to be something different, but still be there and affect change. Not to simply go up in the stands and say, hey, wash my hands. This ain't my game. This isn't my game. Because if we do that, what kind of what kind of referee does that make us? You're not a referee at that point. You're a bystander. And God has called us to throw some flags and affect the game. God has called us to be involved. God has called us not to take sides, but to make sure that both sides know his authority. Both sides know the rules and regulations that we are the visible image of God here on earth. We are the body. So, what is a disciple? What, what is a referee? A referee or a disciple is one who has renounced him or herself and has pledged their life to be a lifelong apprenticeship to the Lord Jesus Christ where they are learning to make every decision according to God's kingdom rules found in the word of God. That's, that's what a disciple is. And you certainly can't make disciples. You certainly can't show anybody else how to be a referee until you first learn the rule book yourself. Until you first learn to exercise the rule book yourself. But once we learn to do that, once we are able to do that, once we are, when we know when the right flag to throw, once we know the right penalty to call, once we know that sometimes we don't understand and we just got to look up to the box. We, gotta, we have to look up to the man who knows 
all and sees all. And ask for the instant replay. Ask for help. Ask for assistance. Because he sees everything. We have to ask our Heavenly Father for some help. But he didn't, he didn't design it where we couldn't ask for help. He said he is always available. He's never missed a phone call. Never missed a phone call. Never missed a text message. So, with that being said, I close with this. Matthew 28 and 18 says that all the authority on heaven and earth have been given to me. That's what Jesus is saying. And then he says, he gives an instruction. He gives a command, actually, to go and make disciples. I hope you will join us next week as we talk about the authority that God has given us the, the authority that supersedes the authority of this world that he gives us to go and make disciples. Thank you so much for joining us on this day. Uh, will you pray with me? Our gracious God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for ministering to us on this day. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for showing us, Lord, that, that you have called us to a certain position. You have called us to be your disciples. You've called us to learn the rule, Lord. You, you've called us uh, so, that, and, and, and so that we can be set aside, so that we can be set apart for your use, oh God. Because there are some people that are still struggling. There are some people that are still suffering in sin, Lord. And how will we reach them, oh God, unless, unless we put some action on saying that we are here to exercise and impute your authority on this game, on this, your kingdom, oh God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for having your mighty way. We thank you for continuing to be patient with us as you make us your disciples. Lord, we pray that you will bring us back next week and that we will dive a little bit deeper. Now that we've talked about what, what it is to be a disciple, you will allow us to, to use these same principles, apply these same principles to making disciples. Because disciples beget disciples. And if we're not disciples of you, we certainly can't produce disciples of you. We want disciples that make disciples, that make disciples, that make disciples. Because that's what you've called us to. Thank you. Thank you, O oh God, for just continuing to bless us for, for all that you have done, for your word going forth, using us as a vessel for your will and your way. It's in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you and God keep you.